is our speaker today, um, Reverend Professor David Wilkinson. He has written a number of books, uh, Hawking and God, uh, Christian Eschatology and the Physical Universe, God, the Universe and Everything, 42 Days Through Faith and Pop Culture, uh, The Case Against Christ, Creation, God, Time and Stephen Hawking, and so on and so on. Uh, he's um, very well known. Many of you will have heard him, um, his regular and very stimulating and helpful contributions to Thought for the Day on Radio 4. He's currently principal of St. John's College in Durham, where I have the privilege of coming across him regularly and frequently. He teaches and researches in the theology department, Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University. But before working in Durham as a theologian, he was a scientist, <coughs> and then a Methodist minister in inner city Liverpool. And his background is research in theoretical astrophysics. Uh, his PhD was in the study of star formation, the chemical evolution of galaxies, and terrestrial mass extinctions, <laughs> such as the event which wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, I think he's one of the very few people probably in the world who have, in fact he may be the only person in the world, who has a doctorate in both science and also theology. There can't be very many of them around. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, published a wide range of papers on those subjects. He studied theology at Cambridge when he was studying, preparing for the Methodist ministry, and has served in a variety of appointments. I mentioned the Church in Liverpool. He was also a Methodist chaplain at Liverpool University. He uh, held a fellowship in Christian apologetics at St. John's and was also then associate director of the Centre for Christian Communication. Uh, he's been principal of St. John's College uh, for the last eight years and his current work uh, on which he broadcasts, writes and uh, speaks involves the relationship of Christian theology to contemporary culture, everything from science through to pop culture, and he's always had an interest in this dialogue between science and religion, especially as it impacts the physical sciences. As we're all very well aware, this is a tremendously important area for all of us, the whole world of apologetics and how we convey the gospel in today's world. And we are really delighted to have David with us. Uh, very, very grateful to him in a frantic schedule, <laughs> as I know, um, uh, sparing today to come to be with us. David, bring your hands. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very uh, generous introduction. Thank you so much. So generous. I'm quite looking forward to hearing myself speak, actually. <laughs> but, uh, I should say, in deference to uh, a number of folk uh, throughout the world, that there are quite a few of us with doctorates in both theology um, and physics. Uh, um, the only thing that two doctorates has ever done for me is, is an afternoon on Radio Newcastle devoted to Dr. Dr. Jokes. <laughs> that was the high point of my media career. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be with you uh, today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's quite nerve-wracking, I have to say. Coming to a group of, of a number of people who I recognize very well, um, students at uh, Cranmer Hall, who might have heard one or two of these stories before, and people who've known me for a lot longer uh, walked in and found someone I was at theological college with, Philip <coughs> Peacock and Jeff Thomas, who led one of the first missions that I was on. Um, and in fact, coming to, to speak to colleagues is always quite nerve-wracking. We, uh, uh, we got rid of one of our cars, and uh, so I got uh, these days to either go on the bus or walk into work. Walking into work is, is lovely. I can listen to uh, the Bible on uh, my phone and do my Bible reading as I walk. Uh, going by bus, there's not enough time for that. And so on the bus, I read the Metro newspaper. <laughs> that great joy each morning until this week. 
This week, two journeys with the Metro newspaper. Now, my journey is about eight minutes, which means that I can start the sport, move to the celebrity gossip, and then if there's enough time, fill in the news. And I actually can do most of the Metro newspaper in that length of time. Uh, first morning, uh, I uh, put the Metro newspaper back into the box at the front of the bus. A woman sitting beside the box looked at me and tut-tutted, as if to say, how dare you, after messing up that newspaper with your germs and dirty hands, put it back into the box. I got off the bus feeling well told off by the stare that she'd given me. So the following day, I decided to do the different thing. The following day, I took my paper off the bus with me, and having read it, went to a recycling bin, and was about to put it in, when somebody else came up behind me and said, I'd not do that if I was you. I turned around and I said, what? She said, well, many of us like to read the Metro on the way back tonight. You should leave it on the bus. <laughs> I said, well, I was just told off the previous day. She said, well, I, 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 mean, I come to clergy conferences and often I feel like reading the Metro on the bus. You have some people who say to you, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do to make your church grow. This is what you have to do to be effective in ministry. And then I come to some conferences where the things that I'm already doing, it's almost as if I'm hearing, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> I'm very conscious that I come this morning with my prejudices. By the end of the day, you might call them insights, but they're prejudices or insights. They're things that have worked for me and are important to me in my ministry. What I, I don't come is to say this is normative for everyone. Hopefully what I can do is say these are things that, that are really important to me. What do you think? How does this play out in your context, in your ministry? Um, how does it weave into your backgrounds and your theological insights, stroke prejudices, work out? And so, uh, forgive me if at times I've become so carried away with my own excitement about some of these issues that I give that impression that this is normative. <coughs> well, what I want to try and do in the, in the space that we've got is to pick up exactly what Bishop James said, and that is to talk about both the content and the style of engagement of the gospel and culture in the 21st century. And to do that with some reflections on my own interest in science and media, and my own uh, encounter with widespread indifference to the gospel, as I see it today. Uh, so let me just, uh, because it's the uh, beginning of the day, just show you one or two pictures, images, of what this might mean. Uh, the first is from uh, a comedy series called Gavin and Stacey, which you will know pretty well. Um, Gavin from Essex has gone down to South Wales um, to meet his bride-to-be, and uh, the family get together for the first time, and uh, this happens on a Saturday evening. Oh. How many times does, uh, does it just cringe with uh, having seen that either in ourselves or in other ministries? <laughs> it's fine, it's just when it gets with people that the problem starts. <laughs> or or that, that little thing right at the beginning, did you notice, you guys, uh, Simon Cowell would sign you up for the pop factor. <laughs> ah, that's the X factor. <laughs> and, uh, and God's a bit like that. Jesus is a bit like that. Um, well, that's one picture. Let me show you a second. This is uh, from Outnumbered. And this is where Karen um, has to bury her mouse. 
the reality is that we live in a culture where, uh, in sickness and in health, may the force be with you because you're worth it. As <laughs> you're all interlinked, aren't they? So the spirituality and some of that folk stuff is all there in people's minds and how do you untangle it? And part of you wants to stand up and say, look, Jack, that's not right. And then there's another dimension, which is that lovely line, isn't it? But if you happen to go to hell, you can have cheese on toast. <laughs> uh, one more picture. This is Ricky Gervais in his um, stand-up routine. <coughs> Gervais, of course, one of many new atheist comedians who have taken up the themes uh, of the new atheists, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they're sometimes called, Dawkins, Harris, Hitchens, um, and Daniel Dennett, and Gervais and Izzard and a number of others. Um, pick up this conflict between science and religion. This is, I think there may be one slight naughty word in here, forgive me uh, for that, uh, but this is uh, just a little bit from Ricky Gervais. <coughs> just keep those pictures in your minds as we go through today. Um, the tradition of apologetics um, has gone in lots of different directions. Uh, it was focused in Alan Richardson's uh, book, Christian Apologetics. And Richardson uh, wrote that the, um, the nature of Christian apologetics is the study of the ways and means of defending Christian truth, a study undertaken by Christians for Christians. Just notice one or two things about that definition of apologetics. The study of the ways and means of defending Christian truth, a study undertaken by Christians for Christians. And there's been a stream of Christian apologetics which has embodied that kind of definition, that you work out what the main attacks are on the Christian faith. You go into a holy or intellectual huddle. You work out what the answer is to that kind of attack. And then you're ready to speak it. The fact that no one by that stage is actually asking the question or not <laughs> is irrelevant. But you notice the defensive movement to that. The sense that we are under attack and therefore we have to in some way defend the faith. Remember Spurgeon being asked to defend the Bible. And the Bible, he said, it's rather like being asked to defend a lion. We're not in the business of defense. So I find uh, Alistair McGrath much more helpful in uh, trying to breathe life into a different type of apologetics. For McGrath, uh, the chief goal of Christian apologetics is to create an intellectual and imaginative climate conducive to the birth and nurture of faith. I like that. First of all, an intellectual and imaginative climate together. Something about conducive climate to the birth and nurture of faith. So it seems to me that the nature of Christian apologetics in the culture that we find ourselves in is something about the combination of intellect and imagination, issuing in both a defending and a commending of the faith. And I suppose if we want to put another I in there, with integrity. On the handout that I've given you, I've given you one or two things just to have a look at and one or two quotes to think about, I'm not going to go through every bit of it, and there's a bit of further reading if you want to have a look at it. Um, the biblical material, in terms of apologetics, um, the word apologia, of course, is used by Paul in Acts 22, Acts 24, Acts 26. Um, often translated, Paul makes his defense, or his sense of defending himself in trial situations, Actually, for Luke, it's much more than that. Because here's an opportunity, as we reflected on in 
our opening worship. This is not just about challenge, a defensive step. This is about recognizing opportunity to share the gospel in a way that's culturally relevant and has integrity. And also in our morning worship, perfectly picked up was that verse from 1 Peter 3, uh, 15 to 16. And it's interesting that in many books on uh, apologetics, you'll find this verse quoted like this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But of course the verse goes on, doesn't it? How does it go on? But do this with gentleness and respect. John Calvin, in his commentary on this verse, says that that latter clause is, as John Owen translates a most necessary admonition. If you don't understand that it has to be done with gentleness and respect, you miss the point of what it's about. But do this with gentleness and respect. It's not just the content of our engagement. It's the nature of our engagement, which is gospel. Um, and so let me, uh, from that point, take you to a particular biblical picture and invite you just to reflect on this for a moment or two. If you happen to have Bibles with you, uh, but don't worry if you don't, uh, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 17? <coughs> Acts 17. We're going to look at from verse 16 through to the end of the chapter. So Acts chapter 17. Um, this is Paul in Athens. Um, why do I go to this particular passage to talk about apologetics in contemporary culture? Well, you could say uh, it has parallels with our own culture. That is, uh, it's a culture which was biblically illiterate, a culture that was pluralistic. And one can make those kind of parallels. But one of the reasons that I go to this passage is that I think Paul found it really difficult in Athens. As some of you will know, the older commentators point out that Paul had a really difficult time in Athens. And they make the link with uh, 1 Corinthians and say that Paul got his evangelistic strategy wrong in Athens. That it was far too philosophical, it was far too theological. Um, he didn't get very much uh, response, and therefore he went back to preaching the simple gospel of Christ and Christ crucified uh, in, in Corinth. I think that misunderstands the nature of how Paul contextualized the gospel. But I think it is true that he found that Athens was a tough place to preach the gospel. And that's why I think Luke at the end of the chapter, says some became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And then one or two biblical commentators have tried to get Paul out of this kind of sense of failure by saying the old thing that you often say is, he didn't get many converts, but the ones that he did get were significant. <laughs> We may have produced 10,000 Gospels to give away. Only two were taken, but those two were significant. We often say to us, <coughs> sometimes we just have to acknowledge it's been tough. It didn't work out like we expected it to work out like. I was once in a, in a seminar, I rather like this, Nigel Wright, the, uh, who became then principal of uh, Spurgeon's College, was talking about one or two things, and he talked about how he'd just been in um, Cuba, where the Baptist church was undergoing revival. And Nigel said that uh, the first night he was there, he preached, and 30 people or so became Christians at the end of the service. Next night he preached again, another whole load of people became Christians. The next night he preached again, 
people came forward then. He said, by the end of the week, I could have stood in the pulpit and simply read from the telephone directory and people would have become Christians. So powerfully was the spirit moving. And then he said, I come back to this country and I preach the same sermons with the same amount of prayer and I'm lucky to get nice hymns, Pastor, as people passing at the door. He said, what is it that's different about Huber and here? Well, actually, it's about history, and it's about sociology, and it's about um, the way the spirit is moving in, in unpredictable ways in different parts of the country. Uh, and then he paused and he said, you know, it's not always our fault. There was a collective sigh from all of the church leaders and preachers who were there. Because often we say to ourselves, if only we were better preachers, if only we prayed more, if only we were better apologists, if only we followed what David Wilkinson had told us that clergy conference, then all would be well. No. Sometimes we just have to say to one another, this is a tough mission field. Yes, we do need to pray more. We do need to be better preachers. But sometimes we just have to recognize that it's tough. Now, forgive me, sisters and brothers, your ministry may be like being in Cuba at the moment. Praise the Lord for that. But I suspect that most of us find this a tough mission field. And this is Paul in Acts for me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to simply read this passage. I'm going to ask you um, to pick out one or two things that you hear afresh this morning. I mean, we know this passage. We've read it ourselves. We've preached on it ourselves. But just one or two things that might hit you afresh about this passage. And then I'm going to ask you just to have a chat with your neighbor about it for a few moments. Okay? What do you hear in the Word of God this morning for you? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? I was remarked. He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent that time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting in Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God this, did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. 
For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Let's turn to the person beside you, just for a moment or two. What, uh, what hit you afresh about Paul's experience in Athens from that passage? Just have a quick conversation. just offer you one or two things which may or may not resonate with you. These are some of the things that speak to me from this passage. The first is that sense of being deeply distressed, linked to the sense of waiting. Here's my um, heretical reading of this portion of Acts. Uh, that is, I think Paul was on holiday in Athens. <laughs> Uh, the reason for that is if you read this section of, of Acts, you'll find that he's going through a really difficult time. He's fallen out with his long-term uh, friend and mission partner, Barnabas. They've decided to go in different ways. Paul thinks that the Spirit is leading in one way, but then um, through a vision dream, he's directed in a different way. He ends up in Philippi. We often remember Philippi jailer converted. What we don't often remember is being beaten, flogged, and thrown into prison. He then arrives in Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, a mob forms, and they run him out of the city. He goes down the road to Berea, where he starts preaching again. The mob from Thessalonia hear what's happening in Berea, and so they rent a coach, and they go down the road, um, and they attack him in Berea. And I think, at that stage, I think Silas and Timothy, can I take him aside and say, Paul, to be very honest, you're more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> you're tired out. You're causing all of this hassle. Why don't you just go on to Athens and have a bit of a break? Um, we can deal with the building up of the church here. Uh, and of course, I read that because um, that once happened to me in my ministry. <laughs> I got so tired in Liverpool and so uh, so ground down that the church said, you need three months uh, to be renewed. And yes, the Methodist church can exist without an ordained person for three months. And so get yourself off some way. And Paul finds himself, as Luke says, waiting in Athens, it's an interesting word just hanging around, uh, just being there. And it's quite a contrast to this image of Paul charging around the ancient world, getting somewhere, going immediately to a synagogue, preaching the gospel, doing this and that, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens. He was greatly distressed. Um, that's an interesting word. Uh, English is a beautiful language, isn't it? Kind of distressed sometimes can be, oh, we've run out of cucumber sandwiches, isn't that awful? I mean, the word here is stomach churning, epileptic fit kind of physical, emotional engagement with what, what was going on. And that was a very interesting point about um, that he didn't immediately respond out of his distress. That he took a bit of time. He took a bit of time um, to process it, um, to begin to work it out. And there's something here, I think, about um, the importance of waiting and our emotional engagement with the culture that we find ourselves in. There's something about whether uh, our hearts are still warmed. 
by the love of God and the need of the people. Albert Adler, the great Methodist historian, um, once pointed out, that, very heretically to many Methodists again, that the most significant moment in Wesley's ministry, in Wesley's Christian life, was not the sitting too near a stove in Aldersgate Street and feeling strangely warm. <laughs> the most significant moment in Wesley's life was when Whitfield asked him to come and preach outdoor to the miners. That actually, Adler says in a lovely phrase that Wesley's passion for souls became compassion for people. His passion became compassion for people. Apologetics in the 21st century, I, I don't think, is about getting the right answers, <coughs> getting the, the brilliant strategy. Those, in a sense, will come on to. It starts with that sense of deep compassion that we have for the people that we serve and love, um, share life with. I mean, I don't need to remind you of that. Although I actually need to keep reminding myself of that. And then there's something, I think, which is about the time spent in the marketplace, just hanging around. Um, as well as in the marketplace day by day, with those who happen to be there. Isn't that another interesting phrase? With those who happen to be there. Imagine him just wandering around, having a chance here and there with those who happen to be there. So the cliche is, of course, always that you have to spend time in the Agora before you get invited to the Areopagus. Um, but what does it mean to spend time in the marketplace of ideas? How much time can you make in ministry? to watch the television, to go to the movies, to listen to the radio, to read the newspaper, um, to spend time just chatting with folk outside the church as well as inside the church. Spending time in the marketplace with those who happen to be there. So that his knowledge of Epicurean and Stoic philosophy, his knowledge of the quotations and the little things that were going on will eventually come out into a sermon, but he needs to invest in the marketplace before he then moves to the Agora. And if you're anything like me, the pressures upon Christian ministry, the pressures of many churches, many parishes, um, is that time in the marketplace is often squeezed out. Um, I have friends uh, uh, who have groups that they meet with once a month or so. Uh, when I was a student chaplain in Liverpool, I would meet um, with a group of students once a month and we'd just have lunch together and I'd say, what are the movies that you're watching? What are the clubs you go to? What are, what are the records, as it was in those days, that you're listening to? Um, just to get a sense of what's going on. I mean, I'd, I'd watch some of the movies, I'd listen to some of their songs, and I have to say, very rarely go to the clubs, but just get a sense of, of the ministry that we're in and spending time for that and feeling that that's important to do. And then something I, I think in all of this about valuing who you are, um, of all of the New Testament folk, who would you want to be? in this situation in Athens, and particularly in the Areopagus. Can you imagine Simon Peter in front of the Areopagus? Can you imagine what that would have been like? Who would you have wanted? Who'd wanted Paul there? And there's something about the divine will which puts us into the right place at the right time, even if we don't fully understand how that happens, if we see the opportunity and we're prepared to be who we are. Um, I think gone are the days where we will have folk like C.S. Lewis, 
who are able to span so many different areas of human knowledge, so many different genres, and be the apologist of a generation. <coughs> knowledge has developed far quickly, exponentially. We become experts in very small areas. <coughs> What we need to do is value each other in the body of Christ and know that the task of apologetics is a communal task together. That some of us will be better in some areas than others. And some of us will have the kind of background that God can use in certain areas. And that we shouldn't worry about trying to span the whole of science, popular culture, ourselves. I'll come back to that in terms of what it means for our laity, not just our clergy, a little later. Um, when I talk about pop culture, people say, well, I mean, I, I, I don't watch Family Guy. I don't particularly want to watch Family Guy. I don't want to watch Star Trek. I don't want to watch Doctor Who. And well, praise the Lord for that. <laughs> because what's worse is the kind of sad dad at the disco scenario, isn't it? The one who thinks that he's down with the young people, but in fact he isn't. And apologetics is about authenticity. I knew that at the age of 11, sitting in a Methodist chapel where the preacher talked about Star Trek and said, on Star Trek, as you know, Dr. Spock. <laughs> yeah, I thought, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. Because I was a Star Trek fan. And I knew that in Star Trek it was Mr. Spock, not an American childcare expert of the 1960s. <laughs> See, our engagement with culture is about valuing who we are, not trying to be someone that we're not. So the time spent in the marketplace listening to ideas is not meant to mean that we're experts at everything, but it's meant that we find a way in where we can weave our interests, expertise, passions, and find areas in culture which we can speak with and to. And again, I'll come back to that a little later. And then there's something here for me in the story about the power of vulnerability. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how you, how you kind of visualize this story. Have Paul striding <coughs> like a Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger up to the Areopagus. Make my day, punk. <laughs> Gotta take that. Let's notice how Luke records this story. Uh, some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? What's this gutter snipe trying to say? What's this young man who doesn't really know the world trying to say? They're already kind of undermining him. What's it mean to, to then go and speak to an audience who are already making fun of you? That's why I hate days like this, I have to say, particularly lunchtime. You know, when, when you're sitting there and you hear a, a conversation about the speaker, <laughs> And you're the speaker. <laughs> no idea what he was on this morning. Uh, what a waste of time this morning. I mean, that won't encourage me to come back into the afternoon session with a great deal of my What's this babbler trying to say? And, and then, a uh, little phrase, they took him and brought him. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a kind of philosophy club. Um, the Areopagus had a sense of, of trial to it, as well as debate. And you notice that this is one of the few places in the Acts of the Apostles where Paul is by himself. Normally he works as a team. Here he's taken by himself. 
<laughs> I've got this image of Paul with his knees knocking, with him wanting to find a toilet, <laughs> of that deep kind of, you know, you know what it's like. When you're in a situation which is beyond your power to control, I sometimes do missions with groups of students and uh, did one in a Scottish university uh, where uh, the CU uh, were doing a, a mission and I had to preach the university sermon on the Sunday morning. I was taken into this wonderful church. Um, the, the wooden floor was so polished that I could have straightened my tie in it. It's one of those mornings where you realise that you've, you've dipped uh, uh, your jacket into the tomato ketchup for breakfast and not noticed until you're walking down the aisle. And I was taken and there was a little man with a with a silver stick who showed me to the place and when it was my turn to preach he came and took me to this pulpit and one climbed the stairs and then he shut the door, they lock you in and so you until you preach the sermon. And there I was on, on this pulpit looking down at the congregation, preaching on the cross. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and then I went to do something back in Liverpool where I'd been for about 10 years, and students there had chosen a different strategy. They'd chosen to go uh, and help held their talks in a pub. We knew the pub quite well. It was a pub that in those days when you lost your car radio, you would go to and buy it back. <laughs> that was, that was a pub. And, and so we were in the, in the pub and, uh, and people coming and going and, you know, I mean, uh, people shouting out and all the rest of it. And I was there and on one of the evenings, um, the pub was projecting the England match on the big screen. And so I was trying to shout uh, the gospel um, and all the rest of it. and which is the context where power of the Spirit engages. Colin Morris said this wonderful thing when he said, power-filled wor power words are spoken not from the pulpit but from the cross. Our vulnerability in modern culture uh, is extremely important. It's a learning experience. It's an experience where the Spirit of God can work. And yet, how many of us want to control the apologetic environment? To bring people onto our territory, into structures and informalities that we're in control of and we understand. Um, what a great book to, to write. Um, because so much of the messages in our context are, are there and people don't understand what's going on. So what does it mean to create, remember McGrath's, a climate conducive to the birth and nurture of faith? It seems to me that something about our vulnerability in that. And, and science and popular culture makes us vulnerable at times, doesn't it? Science says. I mean, biology, I mean, if someone says, you know, as biology has shown, I'm completely out of my depth. I mean, I've got a bit of science, but it, it's, it's all in the physical sciences and cosmology. And science comes with a certain amount of authority. Um, and Dawkins says, well, you know, my authority as a scientist means that I can speak this, that, and the other about theology. Or the rolling news media at such a pace so that you prepare the perfect sermon on a Saturday night. You know, it's even finished before match of the day, so you can sit down and watch it, uh, or even strictly come dancing, if you're really good at preparing sermons. <laughs> um, and then you get up on a Sunday morning, and, and the news has changed, and do you go with this perfect sermon that you've prepared? Or do you go with that moment, Diana's death, of Philippines, and it makes us vulnerable. But there's something which is powerful in that. And then there's something for me about a relevant message. Um, I, I mean, I do think 
that he begins with their experience. But within that, there is respect. I don't think he's making fun of them. I say, people of Athens, I see that in many ways you are very religious. I think he's being serious. I think he's being respectful. But then, of course, there is, as um, one of the people said, a challenge alongside the respect at which you worship. I'm now going to proclaim to you. Let me tell you about Jesus and the resurrection. Let me tell you about how God has raised this man from the dead and therefore expects all people everywhere to repent. And then there's something about the use of quotes, ideas as reason. Uh, C.K. Barrett, that great Durham New Testament scholar, uh, in commenting on this passage, said that it's as if Paul puts Epicurean and Stoic philosophy on one side of the page and the gospel on the other side of the page. And he builds the bridges between the two. And on the basis of the bridges, he preaches the gospel. Um, and there's challenge, and just to make it clear, there's a mixed reaction at the end. Some of them sneered. Isn't that just awful? You've, you've given yourself, you've preached yourself, and the reaction is some of them sneered. Uh, uh, I, I've often thought about having an inbox uh, for email, which is those who have sneered. Because after I try and do thought for the day, uh, I often get some very interesting reaction. There's a wonderful website called Platitude of the Day, which makes fun uh, of your attempt to do thought for the day. I've never had the courage to look at it for the past few years <laughs> because it's so powerful. Uh, that sense of, of when we give ourselves sin, well, that's just part of the territory, isn't it? We share it together, we do it with honesty. Now, there'll be lots more in that passage. Let me, um, can I just check it? It's 1230 that this second, okay. Let me move on. If you want to turn over the page, now let me just try and work this out in a number of, of principles that are important to me. Remember what I said at the beginning, and uh, see how you filter them and use them. And this is, this is, if you like, trying to take the biblical pictures and taking some of those pictures of our temporary culture that, that I showed and saying, okay, let, let's put these together and what might come out of it. The first is this. This seems to me apologetics in the 21st century is more about relevance rather than defense. It's more about relevance rather than defense. Now, don't get me wrong. I think new atheism is a significant <coughs> phenomenon. Um, but I just wonder whether it's on the way itself. Um, New Atheism has been a, a, a particular critique of religious faith and has worked out into popular culture in lots of different ways. But I think for most people, the question is not, what's the problem with the gospel? The question is, is it relevant at all? What does it mean for my life? Uh, and so the whole uh, sense of us being in a post-Christian culture, for me, is a very important part of the territory in this. Uh, some of you will know uh, some of this work, even if you haven't read the book. You can have a look at the covers. Here's Steve Bruce's God is Dead, Secularization in the West. Um, the church has been made into a carpet factory. Callum Brown's The Death of Christian Britain, the little statue of Jesus in the corner of a room uh, with the wallpaper peeling off, and the message is, is obvious that um, we're in a stage of religious decline, well, this is the argument, and Bruce is very strong in the secularization thesis to say that um, science, education, inevitably lead the decline of religious belief. 
uh, wherever, wherever you find science and technology, that happens. Trouble is, it's far more complicated than that, isn't it? As we know. In this country, as my colleagues in Durham and, and others have shown, David Goodhue, that uh, in various places, including London, um, the churches are growing uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, and then, as Grace Davy in a series of books has pointed out, that the secularization thesis in itself doesn't quite work. Uh, Grace has a number of, of uh, key themes. Uh, one or two, uh, I think, are very important for me. The first is her argument that we're in a phase where we are moving from belonging to believing. That no longer do people want to belong to organizations, including churches, but belief is still there. Oh, as John Drain often puts it, there's a great deal of spiritual hunger in the West. The problem is that not, in, not many people think they're going to get a good meal in the churches. Okay. And then there's something which Grace calls vicarious religion. Um, the sense that we want religion done for us in some way, even if we don't want to do it ourselves. So we want places where we can hatch, match, and dispatch. We want places where if there is some kind of tragedy, there is a place to say prayers. Sense of vicarious religion. Now, I think even that's quite complicated because I think that may vary from the rural to the urban settings. And I think it depends also on which particular church you're in. Uh, how strong vicarious religion is. Uh, the role of the established church, the Church of England, I think is very strong in the sense of vicarious religion. Although different parts of the country where there is an established church, but it may not you know what I mean, uh, it will vary. The third thing, uh, again, which was uh, picked up earlier in uh, just a, uh, uh, something that Bishop Jones said, is uh, in Grace's book, Europe, the Exceptional Case, that secularization is context-dependent. Because if you look at somewhere like South Korea, for example, where there's been a tremendous growth over the past century in science, technology, education, you also see alongside it a phenomenal growth, not just in Christian churches, but in a number of different faith communities that what's happened in the West is not inevitable in other parts of the world. And in fact, in other parts of the world, we're seeing different things happening in different ways. But I think um, the secularization hypothesis does shed a little bit of light to say that in our context in the UK, we are in this post-Christendom environment. <coughs> where we've gone through a period of history where Christianity has been of some importance. <coughs> and we're moving out of that, and we're having to deal with the consequences of that. And therefore, there are issues of biblical literacy around in a post-Christendom environment. We did a bit of work just uh, uh, five years or so ago thousand people up and down the country we interviewed um, about their knowledge of the Bible. It was uh, some fascinating results. 70% of households from this survey, which was done in some depth, still have Bibles. That surprised us, actually. Uh, and yet, if you ask people um, for any details at all about well-known Bible stories, such as the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son, 60% of people couldn't say anything about those stories. What was even worse was that there's no real difference between those who said they went to church and those who didn't have <coughs> knowledge of Scripture. Now, how many times uh, do we say, oh, well, as you remember in the story of the prodigal son, <laughs> or as you well know in the story of the Good Samaritan, there's something here about recognizing a level of biblical illiteracy. 
How do we, in the current image, build bridges with those um, whose knowledge of faith or biblical knowledge may be very small indeed in a post-Christendom world? I think I want to return, therefore, to say um, what are the gifts and the backgrounds and expertise and insights that God has given us and God has given to the people in our churches uh, for me, um, really, um, I've got one subject that I talk about, and that is uh, a subject that I spent uh, years of my life working in and struggling with, and asking the questions of relevance between the work that I did and the Christian faith that I have. Um, some of those questions I've not got answers to, but I struggled with it. And therefore, when uh, Stephen Hawking published A Brief History of Time and sold 10 million copies of this book, um, which is a considerable amount for a science book, particularly if it's a science book that deals with everyday concepts such as 26-dimensional space and Riemannian geometry and things of that sort. Um, actually, I've struggled with this myself of what it means to believe in a creator God. If Hawking is going to come along and say, at the very first moment of the universe's history, I may have a theory which will explain how the beginning occurred. And uh, in that, I've already struggled a bit with what it means for an absence of God. And even before we published the book, I'd come to this knowledge that that old Christian argument that if the universe began with a big bang, then who lit the blue touch paper? You know that argument? Is what Charles Coulson would have called the God of the gaps argument. That if science has some ignorance to it, beware of inserting God as the explanation into that gap. Because when Hawking and others come along, um, God is pushed out into irrelevancy. Um, but I struggled also with this sense that lots of Christian views of creation, my own view of creation at times, has been more deistic than theistic. That is, a God who reaches out his hand and lights a blue touch paper and then retires a safe distance saying, cheerio folks, see you on Judgment Day. But the God of the New Testament is the God who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, keeping it in existence moment by moment. God's creative work is not just at the first moment of the universe's history, it's at every moment over the 13.8 billion years of its history, sustaining every moment, sustaining uh, the universe. And even through those struggles of rejecting certain arguments, I come to see that science raises the question of why the universe. Uh, it doesn't answer the question of why the universe. <coughs> and it, it raises the question of where do the laws of physics themselves come from? <coughs> so the universe begins through a quantum fluctuation in the field leading to an inflationary expansion, which then leads to a double expansion of the Big Bang. You can quite rightly say, but well, where does quantum theory itself come from? That's not God of the gaps. <coughs> That's uh, saying that scientists assume that the laws are there. Now, where do the laws come from? Now, don't, uh, one or two of you who are getting worried that we're going to go into electron science, uh, we're not. Um, but I simply say that to say that those are the questions that, as a disciple, I spent years struggling with. Now I have some uh, knowledge and expertise to begin to build the bridge in the public arena between uh, the phenomenon of Hawking uh, or someone like Paul Davis, uh, who, in a series of books on cosmology, you remember it's 1983, the book uh, where he wrote, in my opinion, Science offers a surer path to God than religion. 
extraordinary thing. So that in the public arena where there's interest about science and faith, I have some expertise to build a bridge. And my question is not uh, which book on modern cosmology you're going to read in the next few days. My question is, what's your expertise that you bring to the table? What's your background? And what's the expertise and the background for building bridges do the folk that we minister to and minister with have to bring to the table? Um, building bridges is an incarnational model where the person is important in order to build that bridge. You can read the book on apologetics and read the arguments here, there, and everywhere, but it comes with um, integrity and authenticity if it comes out of a person. Um, and that's, I think, one of the ways that we begin to deal with the question of relevance. How is the gospel relevant to science? Well, let me try and tell you about it because I've tried to live with that. I've tried to live it. I've tried in a small way to deal with that. How do we therefore affirm each other and affirm the background and skills and expertise and passions that folk in our congregation have? That's the first thing. Second thing is that apologetics in the 21st century, for me, it is about a global perspective. I'm going to tell you a story now, and I'll tell you it as it happens. See what you make of it. I was in a seminar on evangelism, and we were being addressed by an African Methodist minister. Overnight, while I was sleeping in his hut, unknown to him, a member of the village uh, snuck into his hut and stole his Bible and Methodist hymn book and took them to the river by the side of the village and threw them into the river. Next morning, he, he woke up and discovered that his Bible and Methodist book had gone. So he went to the elder and he said, I'm not leaving until I get my Bible and Methodist book back. By the way, not the first Methodist to risk death by sticking to the old Methodist hymn book, but anyway. <laughs> he and his, he and his, he and his translator um, stood in the centre of the village and they prayed and uh, the Lord said, go to the river. So they walked to the river, they didn't know why. They stood by the side of the river, prayed again. He said, out of the river rose my Bible and Methodist hymn book and landed on the bank. And he paused in his telling of the story. And he looked at the 40 of us who were sat in front of him. Majority, middle-aged, white, male church leaders. He said, I know what you're all thinking at this point. He said, your minds have been educated and shaped by the questions of David Hume. You're all sitting there thinking, hmm, reliability of the witnesses. You're thinking about one occurrence compared to many occurrences. You're thinking about the law of gravity and what force might there be which lifts this Bible and Methodist temple down of the river. And some of you are even thinking, was the Bible and Methodist temple wet or dry? <laughs> he said, they're all valid questions, he said. But for me in that context, they weren't the most important questions in that moment. In that context, the most important question was who was the most powerful? Was it the Lord? Jesus, or was it the gods of nature? And then he said, beware that your questions don't squeeze out other people's questions. That's a really interesting moment for me. So that those questions of David Hume are actually really important. They're part of our culture, our education system, but how often do I assume that there are certain apologetic questions there. But I've not spent enough time in the marketplace to learn that there may be very different ones. And so I bring my expertise, yes, but I've then got to remember 
that we live not just in a global village now, but in a global living room, <coughs> where through the power of the web, I'm introduced <laughs> to so many different questions in so many different ways. Do I give space to hear some of the questions that people are really asking? rather than what I expect them to ask. I, I do lots of uh, talks on science and religion, and one of the real dangers for me is when, when, when someone at the end of the talk starts a question, is I often, my mind runs away, and instead of listening to the question, I think, oh, I've heard that one before, and I get the stock answer ready for that one. And suddenly, right at the end of the question, you're going a different way. Am I prepared to listen enough to stay with the questions, to stay with the story, to understand what's going on? And then to say, well, maybe I'm not the right person to answer this. Maybe so-and-so who's sitting in the front row is much better to answer this. So a global perspective. And I think also, our ability to hear from our brothers and sisters in churches throughout the world is extremely valuable on this. Not just on the ethical questions, but on the apologetic questions. We need to learn in a global environment and to value the insights that are coming from different places. Um, one Point and then I'll, I'll pause and we'll have lunch if that's all right. Third thing for me is something about stimulating the imagination. I mean, I, I love uh, uh, John's Gospel. Um, John for the woman at the well. Jesus says to this woman, my dear, have you ever considered the eschatological dimensions of the atonement? <laughs> That's the way that Jesus talks to her, isn't it? Of course not. What about this living water he talks about? What about this sense of the kind of water that would just quench every thirst? You come here every day at the height of the sun, you've got this big water jar, you fill it up, you take it away, it gets empty, you've got to bring it back. What would it mean for you? water, uh, such quality, never-ending water, what, what would it feel like? And John's Gospel is full of this, stimulating the imagination, isn't it? Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus, how can I ever compress my dimensions small enough to get back into my mother's womb? Nicodemus, that's not the point, go with your imagination. What does it mean for you as a church leader, a, a civic leader, a theologian of great renown? What does it mean for you to have a brand new start? Just imagine it, Nicodemus. Well, I am the bread of life. What does that actually mean? How many sermons can we preach on that one verse and go in different directions? My wife, who's much more talented at this than I am, um, I was preached in a theological college, and what she did was, uh, preaching on this verse, she brought a bread maker into the leech hall, and she started it off before the service, so that as the service developed, this smell of freshly cooked bread just started to go around, so that when she got to the sermon, uh, I am the bread of life. What does this mean for you? And, and therefore, McGrath's definition of intellect and imagination seems to be very important. And particularly, um, the role of the musician, the artist, the dramatist, the poet, the songwriter, uh, apologetics isn't just for the, um, the academic. By the way, the subtitle to this cartoon is After having made my first point clear, let me move on to the second. <laughs> How do we give space and affirm, not just in worship, but in apologetic ministry, the role of the poet, the role of the artist? 
and a person who works with image and story and narrative. Um, as I'll come back to uh, after uh, lunch. The problem with apologetics, I think, in some ways, has been the impression given that there are easy answers to complex questions. And the need that we often feel to provide the kind of easy answer which reduces the complexity or depth of the question. So that we all have the experience, don't we, of bereavement and the temptation to say something simplistic in order to try and comfort someone. And how dangerous that is. In the apologetic arena, um, uh, the temptation to try and answer every question uh, in a way that doesn't leave the untidiness of the world as it really is, I think is a danger. Let me try and illustrate that. George Morris, uh, uh, a retired professor of evangelism in the States, and George, uh, as well as being a distinguished missiologist, would do uh, various missions around the US, uh, what they would call in the US revivals, uh, these big kind of tent missions. And it was once in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and um, on the afternoon he was walking around inviting people to come to the revival that evening. I mean, walking around in the States is an odd thing to do anywhere. Uh, and he comes to this uh, um, stereotypical um, house in the States where there's a porch, a wooden porch, and there's some rocking chairs, and there's four old men chewing tobacco. And he walks up the drive and they're chewing tobacco and spitting and, and he, George arrives and he says, hello, I'm uh, George Morris, I'm speaking down the road tonight, I'd like you to come to, to the revival. One of the old men looked at him, fixed him in the eye and said, I'll come if you answer this one question. What's the question, says George? The question, said the man, is, did Adam have a navel? <laughs> so George laughs. The old man looks at him and says, You're the first preacher who's seen the joke. Most of them try and give us an answer. <laughs> Come and pull up a chair and we'll talk some more. The apologetic encounter is about us being fully human. John Drain talks about the early church, doesn't he? As one of the characteristics is not just their confidence in the power of the Spirit, but their weakness in the face of the world. The ability for us to sow that profound apologetic response, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Um, that's not a sign of weakness. It may just be the way that it is, actually. Um, and by maintaining who we are in the fullness of our humanity, in the questioning and in the, in the certainty of our community life, which will sometimes say, um, I don't know the answer to that, but um, at least someone in Cumbria has written a book on it, and so let me direct it to that. Or, you know, there's these strange theologians in Durham who might have thought a little bit about that. Um, we're together as a community, we, we, we use one another's strengths, but ultimately also we have to say we don't know. Um, how do we maintain our humanity and the apologetic encounter? Uh, and then, uh, I suppose just to emphasize what I've already said, something about the development of apologists, the developing of apologists. Um, How do we, I mean, who are the key apologists in the workplace? Who are the key apologists in the school? People who live work then all of the time. Uh, how do we as churches affirm that? Now, I've got a great passion here for the scientists. Because, you know, sometimes 
within the within the unwritten things of the church. You have this kind of scale of holiness. You know what I mean? Most holy people are the missionaries. And you come down in holiness just a bit, and then you come to bishops. <laughs> and then you come down in holiness just a little bit more, and well, you know, the evangelists, the clergy, and then come down a little bit. Now, people in caring professions, they're quite holy. Doctors, nurses, folk like that. And you get right at the bottom of the pile to the accountants and the scientists. <laughs> I'm sure you don't have churches like that at all here. What does it mean to see science as a Christian vocation? Kepler uh, saw his work in astronomy as a Christian vocation. Delighted by the disclosure of the beauty and elegance of the mathematics that describe the orbits. What does it mean to say to the scientist, to affirm the engineer, the technologist, and, and say, uh, you are doing Christian work? as much as the missionary or the bishop or the evangelist. A friend of mine who, uh, for a number of years, was on the Human Embryology and Fertilization Committee um, as a scientist, although he happened to be a very strong Christian, uh, goes to a big uh, church, he once said, uh, he said it would be lovely just occasionally for the church to pray for me as much as they pray for the overseas missionaries. Very interesting comment. Um, because apologetics is about giving people confidence, it seems to me. Many of us are gripped by fear. Are we representing the gospel well enough? Are we representing our church well enough? And once I offer a word of testimony, is there going to be that question that comes back, which actually I don't know what the answer is to. Part of giving confidence is not, I think, about giving people a set codified answer to just trot out wherever they are, although helping them think through theologically resources is very important. But it's the very confidence to be who they are as a child called, redeemed by God, um, and for their work and their own thinking to be affirmed. Um, so that when a young person comes to us and says that God's called me to be a full-time Christian worker and I'm going off to college, or maybe Murfield or Cliff College, many churches will bring them to the front, celebrate with them, pray for them, probably give them some kind of financial gift. When a young person says, I'm going off to study sociology, or media studies, or physics, I hope our churches do exactly the same thing. Bring them to the front, celebrate their vocation, give them some money. Uh, uh, developing the pages. Uh, what does it mean if you happen to be in a particular, let me stick with science, just because that's my way in. It'll work out in different ways for you in different places. What does it mean if you have to have a number of scientists together in your congregation? Um, maybe it was, a, I was, I was uh, Malvern Priory the other day, um, where there were a whole number of scientists who were involved in defense industries, and, um, and they had a little group. They got together, um, and they talked theology together uh, with the theological resources provided by the church leaders. And they were able to have this conversation together and then they got enough confidence to have an annual lecture um, and they invited strange people to come and talk at it and then invited their friends along and just that little bit of confidence um, developing the apologists. Now, forgive me, don't hear me wrong, I mean, this is about giving the theological resources. I'm just stressing the other side of it because actually we're very good at producing theological resources at times. Um, but it's, it's how we build up that sense of Christian vocation um, as well. Um, next, and I 
think I'm down to point six out of the uh, 24, no, out of the uh, nine that I've got. Um, taking pop culture seriously. And I say this because um, often pop culture has been seen by the church as either from the devil or too trivial to really take seriously. And of course it is part of an overall movement in the 20th century. Lawrence Levine talked about this movement in terms of his book Highbrow, Lowbrow. He talked about the way that within Western culture there's been a division between the highbrow arts, as he called them, classical music, and the lowbrow arts, rock and roll. Um, and a number of American theologians, such as Bill Romanofsky and others, have picked up on this and said this is exactly what the church in the West has done as well. That we've sanctified the highbrow <coughs> arts and we've demonized the lowbrow arts. But actually, there is good art and there is bad art. And there's good art amongst the <coughs> lowbrow arts just as much as that there is bad art amongst the highbrow arts. And part of, part of our listening in the marketplace, it seems to me, is to engage with those art forms, those stories, those images, those narratives, which are asking the big questions of human existence. The big questions of what it means to be human. The big questions about, is there something more to this life? I'm a great Star Wars fan. Yeah, no, I'm a nerd, science, Star Wars. That's who I am. Um, and uh, Star Wars, of course, is a fantastic uh, uh, story. We just hope that the next three movies will be <laughs> as good uh, as certainly the first three. We'll leave the next three. Just. Um, and, and George Lucas went First of all, you remember the story to two movie studios with a script for Star Wars, and they both say it'll never work. Uh, Fox then uh, gave him uh, um, 50,000 to write the script, he then got 100,000 to direct the movies, and he's made a few billion out of it. He asked the question uh, what is the attraction of Star Wars for people like me? <coughs> Well, when Lucas talks about it, he talks about it as an ice Sunday. So it's a bit like a, you know, a, a, one of these things you go in a restaurant, big glass, and in it you've got lots of different types of ice cream. You've got myth, the great stories of human existence. You've got the Western, this is Han Solo, the gunslinger on the frontier. You've got science fiction uh, images and stories going in there. You've got the space rocks. Uh, this is the 70s. And you've got samurai movies, particularly Akira Kurosawa's 1958 movie, The Hidden Fortress, and they're all piled in there. And then on top of all of that, you've got little bits of religion sprinkled liberally here, there, and everywhere. So in the Empire Strike Backs, back, you get Buddhist imagery. Uh, in The Phantom Menace, you get the virgin birth just kind of popping up out of nowhere. If you know what I mean, it just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the, trouble, the trouble, I think, sisters and brothers in Christ, is that our eyes light up at the little bits of religion. We immediately look at the, you know, this is Buddhist, this is, there was a sister agreeing with me, though, thank you. Um, little bits of, little bits of Christian bit, if, if we can find a Christian bit, a Christian quotation, oh, I'll have that for my sermon. I'll pick it up. But actually, there's something really important about this because there's something that you don't immediately see which is extremely important. That is, in an ice cream sundae, it's the glass that holds the whole thing together that makes it attractive in the first place. Without that glass, it would just be a mess on the tabletop. And, and I would suggest to you that, that the glass in Star Wars terms are the big themes. Hope, good and evil, transcendence, uh, the Force, all of this strange type of stuff. These are the big questions of human existence. And if we approach pop culture, first of all, by, by just looking at the little religious bits, or 
um, uh, purely from asking the ethical questions of the story. Uh, Michael Dyson, a number of years ago, talked about how when you come to a story, you need to have ethical patience. The trouble with many of us is that we make a moral judgment on something very quickly, and we don't stay to the end of the story to see the big themes. And I think this happened in the early stages of Harry Potter. A number of Christians kind of went, ooh, occult, uh, bad behavior. Um, and there was a whole Christian critique of Harry Potter, particularly from the States, which just don't have anything to do with that. As the story develops, as you encounter the story, so you begin to see lots of bigger questions. Philip Fleming uh, was one of our students at Cranwell Hall, and as part of a dissertation, he wrote a little thing which became a growth booklet, one of the first critiques of Harry Potter from a Christian perspective. A lovely little piece of work. Um, and where Philip identified big themes of choices, of good and evil, of transformation, of relationships. And he said, and this was after book four, he said, there's something here about the Christian narrative going on. We had to wait until all Harry Potter books had been written before J.K. Rowling was able to say, well, actually, there's something of the Christian story underneath this. But I didn't want to say anything because I, I didn't want to give away the ending too quickly. Uh, staying with the story. Staying with the big themes. This is about time in the marketplace with the stories of pop culture. Now, that, again, it's not for all of us. You will have your own stories that you immediately relate to, that you connect with, that you can speak with passion about. Now, will anyone be interested? If I speak with passion about Star Wars, well, actually, yes, they, they are because it works for me. David Watson, a number of years ago, uh, one preaches about buying those books, which are great temptation, those books which are 300 jokes to tell during a sermon. You know those books? And you get on Saturday night, you prepare your sermon, you start flicking through desperately trying to get a joke that relates. And David Watson said, if you do buy the book, um, give in to temptation, then make sure that you only tell the stories that make you laugh out loud. Because if they don't make you laugh out loud, they'll not engage. But if they make you laugh out loud, they begin to engage with other people as well. Um, uh, and why do I think Star Wars is about that? Is it just my Christian interpretation upon the story. Well, actually, stories allow you to put an interpretation on it, but there's also the authorial intention as well. And uh, Lucas, in this extraordinary quote, talks about Star Wars and particularly the, the force which he introduced. You know Alec Guinness, who played Obi Wan Kenobi, was coming out of mass one day, uh, and a Star Wars fan came up to him and said, May the force be with you. And Sir Alec, without thinking about it, replied, I'm also with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a stupid thing to say. It's not with another religion. Um, I would hesitate to call the Force God. It's designed primarily to make young people think about mystery. Not to say he is the answer. It's to say, think about this for a second. Is there a God? What does God look like? What does God sound like? What does God feel like? How do we relate to God? Isn't that fascinating? And they're all for merchandising. They're all for special effects and all of that hype. It's a big question about is there more to the universe than just uh, the power of a Death Star? Um, I'm running out of time, uh, forgive me. Um, I, I would have said a little bit more about the medium and the message because I think going back to <coughs> gentleness and respect, um, there's something about the way that we communicate. I think there's something about the language that we use. I think there's something about diversity of approaches in apologetics, where we affirm one another's approaches. Um, we're sensitive about the kind of language. Uh, we can exclude people very easily through some of these things. Um, and we're not showing the respect um, by working hard at our craft. 
And then I was going to say a little more about holding spirituality and truth together, because um, it does seem to me that there's a danger in a postmodern culture, whatever that may mean by the word, that we go to a privatized view of faith, which is, let me simply talk about my experience. Um, there is still a great deal of attention and interest in the modernist questions of evidence <coughs> and truth. Um, I find that all of the time in terms of my own engagement with folk. And so how we hold together word and spirit, evidence and experience, uh, seems to me to be very important. But uh, let me move on to the final point um, by way of a, a, of a very uh, uh, dangerous clip. Uh, this is from an American comedy called Tallahegan Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Will Ferrell plays uh, an American racing car driver uh, who has become extremely <laughs> successful. And this is a family uh, about to have a meal together. <laughs> Apart from the uh, comment on consumer culture states, uh, uh, I love the baby Jesus, I prefer the Christmas Jesus. Um, of course, the way that you understand uh, the nature of God controls the apologetic engagement. Um, I, I try and do thought for the day these days, and uh, it's an immense privilege. And I mean, it's. Uh, Something like seven million people. It's uh, quite terrifying, I have to say, at times. Don English, a great <coughs> Methodist leader, uh, he did it for many years. I remember asking where he got the confidence from to do Thought for the Day on a regular basis. I expected him to say, well, I've been preaching for a long time. I've collected all of these illustrations, all of these stories, all the rest of it. Um, he said, my confidence comes from John chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1. In him all things were created. In him all things hold together. And Donald's point was that if you have this big view of Jesus, then whenever, wherever <coughs> you start in contemporary culture, there is some connection, some path to Jesus. Now, it might be quite difficult to see at times, but it is there. And that's an incarnational model. If you want to develop that into a Trinitarian model, then the sense of God's love for everyone, the work of the Spirit outside the church, not just inside the church, producing opportunities, opening doors in order to build the bridges, did you notice from the Acts passage that, that lovely little aside in Paul's sermon? And remember that, that, that Paul's sermons in Acts are not just to, to record uh, what he was saying, but also for the church to learn principles of mission. That, that aside that says, God does not live in temples built by human hands. Why am I preaching the Areopagus? When it's famous that people just have endless discussions about meaningless things. And there are those in the Christian church who are going to criticize me for going into that kind of place and devaluing the gospel. God does not live in temples built by human hands. And if you have time and you haven't done it already, go back to Acts 17 and look at the times that Paul uh, says the word all, everyone, or everything. God made everything. He made all the nations. He calls everyone to repent. There is a big picture of God here. A gigantic vision of the love of the Father. That at the heart of creation is Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is at work outside the church, in the world, in culture, in science, in movies, in literature, in art. We have to find 
the connection, it's there. And so let me just encourage you in that sense that part of the apologetic engagement, I think, takes us back uh, to our theological um, engagement with uh, our Trinitarian God in worship, in Bible reading, in prayer, in learning together um, as we discover the connections of a God who does not live in temples but by human hands. Um, but it's at work everywhere in him we live and we have our being. <coughs> I'm really sorry, I've gone on till two o'clock um, and I've given no space at all for question and answer and um, vulnerability actually. <laughs> I've been open to question and answer. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, five minutes or do we, do we, have we got a tight program? Go on, thank you. I mean, I probably will mean that no one will want to ask anything at all because we'll want to get home quite rightly. But any immediate responses or, or questions or criticism? Yes, sir. I was struck by something you said earlier on um, about context. And <coughs> in a prayer meeting that I was in a few, a few weeks ago, one of the people who came to that prayer meeting said, we may be the only Bible that many people around us will read. And on the face of it, I thought that was just a fairly folksy sort of thing to say. But the more I thought about it, the greater the truth that is there, I can see. You know, we may be the only Bible that many people around us will have access to and will be able to read. That's very helpful, thank you. Very helpful. Yeah, other quick responses? Probably a good note to finish <laughs> Thank you. Oh, one, one here. I just wondered whether the general tenor of your talk would work back to front. You started with abstract, highbrow, connecting with us as theologically literate. Whether, in fact, if you tried the pop culture illustrations <coughs> and then worked up to the theology later, so that we were going from our unfamiliar, relatively speaking, we're buying into this or that aspect, uh, that, that might sort of work. And that will make it less rushed this afternoon. Mm, thank that you. That's very, very wise advice, although let me just generalise it for a little bit. And it raises a, an issue that John Polkinghorne particularly has emphasised in his apologetic engagement, which is what he calls bottom-up thinking. He says that... Um, what it means by that is that you take a specific instance and you work your theology from the particular instance. That's not to say that your theology is controlled by it, but that your bridge is the instance. So instead of doing um, uh, a talk which would begin the philosophy of science and religion, you take a specific subject, the origin of the universe, the end of the universe, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, biological evolution. You take the for instance and allow people on the basis of, of shared understanding of that move through then to say, well, what's the theological consequences? What are the theological opportunities of that? Um, and I think uh, you can do it lots of different ways. I think for me, I'm just bad with time at the end of the day. Uh, that's probably the physicist in me at all, I would have any work. Thank you, I'd better stop there. <laughs>